Joining us now is Ambassador Julianne Smith, the U.S. Ambassador to NATO here in Washington. And so good to see you here Great on set. You. We usually see each other in Brussels or at a NATO <laughs> meeting somewhere else. Exactly. Us, memorably. <laughs> and other places. So, Ambassador Smith, this new pact, this means certainly more ammunition, more artillery, at the very least, against Ukraine. Can Ukraine now hold its own? It's getting the American deliveries. There was that terrible delay because of the congressional stalemate. And it lost ground after Munich and Vika, all the other setbacks, Kharkiv under, under fire and at risk. But can they now hold the line and stop the Russian advance? Well, you're right. Uh, we did have, unfortunately, a delay of several months while Congress was trying to sort out and finalize the supplemental. Fortunately, our friends in Europe kept the assistance flowing, and they deserve credit for that. But now we're at a point where what's been promised is actually arriving on the battlefield. So our assessment is that the Ukrainians have put to use everything that we've been able to flow into Ukraine these last few weeks. They have stabilized the lines around Kharkiv which is good news. At the end of the day, the Russians weren't able to move that far into Ukraine. We're talking single digits in terms of kilometers. So we feel better that they now have the assistance they need. And again, everything we're doing is paired with what over 49 other countries are doing to provide important security assistance. And NATO is stronger than ever, certainly with Sweden and Finland joining. And, you know, more money, more NATO countries coming up to that 2 percent standard. But what you're also facing is sharp criticism from the Republican candidate. And I know you don't get into politics, but just the facts here. He is saying that Europe is not doing its part, it's still not doing, not pulling its weight. But Europe contributed $50 billion when our supplemental was still at risk. And now there's another $50 billion that the G7 has agreed is going to come from interest on the, the Russian assets that are held largely in Belgium not in the U.S. That's right. We had some breaking news this week. So you'll remember 10 years ago, all NATO allies pledged to spend 2 percent of their GDP on defense. When we made that pledge 10 years ago, we only had three countries at the 2 percent mark. But Jens Stoltenberg, the secretary general of NATO, is in town this week and sat with President Biden and announced that now 23 members of the alliance spend 2 percent. That is a huge leap. It needs to be all 32 allies. So we'll keep pushing. But the fact that we have two thirds of the alliance now spending 2% is a major, major milestone. But you're right to note that burden sharing isn't just about that 2% target. Burden sharing is about doing more for Ukraine. And there we've just had some breaking news. The Germans are offering another Patriot. The Czechs have secured another 500,000 rounds of munitions for our friends in Ukraine. Many other countries are stepping forward. So great to have the U.S. supplemental, but let's not forget that the Europeans are doing their fair share as well. And the Patriots are in sh such sh short supply that part of the job of our uh, of our Pentagon has been to you know, go around to the Allies and find out who can deliver a Patriot while we try to produce more because they are in such short short supply. There is a dispute between us and President Zelensky between the U.S. and Zelensky over the ability to fire back across the border into Russia. Now, they have a limited ability around Kharkiv now to those Russian encampments where they were firing barrages that were had been against Kharkiv. But Zelensky wants more. And the administration is concerned about escalating the war. Isn't the war so far escalated, according to Vladimir Putin calculation, that uh, is, is Ukraine right? that they need the ability to fire back when fired upon. Well, look, since this war started, we've been sitting down with Ukrainian military commanders and President Zelensky on a regular basis to understand what are their immediate needs. Each and every month, Secretary Austin convenes something called the UDCG, the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, where we can hear from them, what equipment do you need? What do you want to talk about in terms of your current strategy? Do you want to 
talk through kind of your plans for the coming weeks, the coming months. And as we do that, we are listening to them. We heard them in early May when they said, we want to go after the places on the other side of the border from which they're targeting Kharkiv. So the U.S. responded. The president made the decision to have a shift in our approach. And we heard them and responded in real time. As we go forward, we will continue to hear from them and determine what exactly they want to do, what they need from the United States and all the other countries. I think right now you've heard the president. His position on the long-range attackums is pretty clear. We are not in a position where we encourage them to use those to strike into Russia. We believe those can be used very effectively in places like Crimea, which is Ukrainian territory, of course. But let's see. You've heard Secretary Blinken say time and time again, we are assessing, we are adapting the policy. And ultimately, this is Ukraine's war to fight, and they will make a determination on the battlefield how to use the assistance that they've received. And what is the hope of getting some of the thousands of children who have been kidnapped, taken across the border, put through, quote, re-education, put up for adoption and taken from the Ukrainian parents? There's so much about this war that just is so hard to process. It's such a great tragedy, the way in which Russia is conducting itself on the battlefield. And you're absolutely right. The way in which they've abducted thousands of Ukrainian children and are now working that, to put those children in Russian homes is obviously a violation of international law. It's, it's, it's a tragedy on a scale that we can hardly comprehend. So we collectively, working with our friends in Europe, working with the Ukrainians, we have to call out this behavior. We have to make sure that every country that's partnering with Russia right now, like North Korea, like the PRC, like Iran, understands what Russia is actually doing on the battlefield and work day in and day out to get those kids back into the homes that they belong in as soon as possible.